All right, uh, week two, uh, we're still on controls. Uh, this is chapter 13 from the Smith book. Uh, we'll try to finish the electronic parts, electrical parts of uh, the Smith book, and do some control. Um, so if you want to read the text, it's probably chapter three question. Get the electricity? Yeah. Uh, so we'll, after finish this chapter, we'll be able to do or identify the major electronic components, and you should be able to do that by now, which are transformers, relays, so if you see them, you won't be shocked, you know what they look like and what they, what they do. Uh, one couple functions of the third controls, all the functions, or what, why do we have them in a the board? Uh, well, to do some troubleshooting. <coughs> we turn this chapter and to short cycling timers. And uh, we have those actually on uh, the Honeywell controllers, the defrost module. model. I'm not going to uh, spend too much time into it. What is a diode? It's part of electronics. So if we have a circuit, probably we will see a diode. Uh, does anybody know what a diode is? Mm -hmm. I what is a diode? Guys. Huh? The light and the wires that come out of the diode. That's a light. Anyway, it acts like a check valve for circuit. We use them mostly to change AC to DC and also for some circuits for controls. So if somebody asks what's a diode, it's a, a gate. It looks like a triangle usually, but it can come in any shape. But its purpose is to let the circuit go only in one way. How does it do that? It's a semiconductor. I'm not going to go too much into electronic components, but at least you will know what, are, what they function, what is the major function in general. Uh, some electronic module and electronic motor overloads. Uh, there are some overload controls, which they can, uh, they, what do they do? They control the temperature. Sometimes they control, really? <laughs> I know I peeped it too, I heard a rapper or something. No, seriously, like you're coming late. <laughs> Only three minutes late. <laughs> and I'm recording and you're eating and chewing in my iPod. You're not gonna hear it. <laughs> Just cut it out, cut that part out. <laughs> light emitting diodes, which are lights. Uh, probably have LED lights now, there are light emitting diodes. I'm gonna put this over here. So she's gonna be chewing on my ass. It's, <laughs> it's pissing me off, man. I'm sorry. I can't wait to watch. I'm sorry. Guys. This is too much, guys. Come on. I'm trying to block. Yeah. You go through the material and everybody else taking the class seriously. Yeah, I'm taking it. I didn't mean Never mind. So, uh, LEDs are light emitting diodes. And uh, they started actually in the 80s with light, small little lights and a circuit board. They don't consume a lot of uh, electricity. However, uh, they act the same way. The semiconductor in the middle, and it glows when uh, current goes through it. What also happens is uh, they used to have LED since the 80s, but they were, not, they were very dim. They weren't as bright as they are today, and they're getting better and better. But the technology is the same. It requires small electricity. It goes through a semiconductor and makes it glow. Uh, rectifier. What do you think rectifier is? Did anybody else get exposed to rectifiers? Yeah, doesn't it uh, like prove that something's working or lets you know? Okay. Like it tells you? Uh, not really, but... Uh, correct? In a way it does that. It does some kind of correcting, it's why? Rectifying, so... In a way, it, that's what it do. So it uh, runs AC through a circuit, and that circuit will rectify DC out of it. So it changes AC to DC. I can do the, the other way around. And uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on that because this will be the basis for uh, flame detection systems, which means what? Uh, there's something in the industrial board called the flame rod. And the flame rod is basically a rectifier. You run AC to it, and through the flame, you change AC to DC. It's kind of like magic, but that thing actually uh, became a turning point in flame detection system. How does it do that? Uh, this is very, very oversimplified. It's not completely scientific. I'm not going to go through the, all the science behind it. But remember when we had the uh, AC current and it's a 
a wave that goes up and down. Yeah. I would say that is going to be plus, the bottom is minus. That's AC. That's uh, alternating current. So a rectifier does, it runs the AC through a circuit, and it will shave those tops. And by using a diode, <coughs> you can just shave off one uh, peak of the AC current and put that through a diode, and we have DC. And this, after it comes out of the rectifier, it will look like just the tops. What is that number for that again? It's like 0 0.707? With the peak voltage. The peak, the peak voltage, no, the, uh, the effective voltage is the peak voltage, which is the top over here, multiplied by the, the sine of 45, which is 0 0.707. So this is how a rectifier function. Uh, you do not need to know all the intricate of it, but it's an uh, electronic circuit that is used to change AC to DC. Uh, solid state. What do you think of when you hear of solid state? Solid. Okay, what else? Yes. So when you buy it, your phone or your computer, it says you have a solid state hard drive. Nothing is moving, right? The old hard drive, they have a disk made out of a magnet and it spins. So it's solid state, so it has a bunch of semiconductors that are used as storage. So this is the storage for uh, many components. And also when we have a solid state component, that means it's completely uh, semiconductor, there's no moving parts. So we have our normal mechanical relay, and we also have solid state relay. If you notice solid state relays, they do not uh, have any moving parts, and they're very small. And they do not, the key uh, element is they do not consume or require a lot of voltage. So you can run a whole control circuit with very, very small amount of power. It just, because you don't need a lot of power to do control. Control is just to make decisions. Open and close gates and give me some decisions. That's why if you look at the thermostat, it runs with battery. Like a AA battery, well, it's enough to run that circuit. It's very small and uh, good size. Semiconductors are the material which we make those circuits with, and it's mostly silicon. Uh, thermistors, what's a thermistor? <coughs> Come on. A sensor? No. sensor for what? Yeah, yeah. Temperature? temperature. How does it sense temperature? Pressure. Pressure. Not pressure. Temperature. Oh. It changes, uh, sorry, it changes resistance with temperature. So a thermistor is one way to, we can change, we can measure temperature, and what it does, we run current through it, and it changes resistance as the t temperature changes. Which makes sense because uh, we said there's a relationship between temperature and uh, resistance. Transistors, small components that are used to send frequencies. And if you take the building management uh, course, we'll go through some transistors. In the beginning, we used to use uh, FM and AM and some kind of frequencies to send signals from one component to another. If you will go to all plants, they still have transistors to send signals for the component to communicate. Again, uh, if you go to huge power plants, sometimes it's impractical to uh, have a wire going all the way from the end of the plant to the other. You can have those little uh, sensors and little inputs with a transistor and uh, transmission device. So you can take the temperature of the tank at the end of the, of the plant without having to go there. And that's the basis of uh, building management control. You have small transistors and small uh, components that will give you feedback all the time. And if you think about it, if you have the smaller the board is and the less uh, energy you use, the more versatile they are. You can put them anywhere with the battery. They do not require a lot of energy. Some of them even are very small, they can go with photovoltaic, with like, like a calculator. So that gives us a lot of freedom. So we can have control with small little voltage and we don't have to run a wire all the way to get only temperature reading on uh, uh, a heating vessel. Fryak and fasteners, those are components for uh, electronics. For, uh, I'm not going to ask you about them, so don't worry about them, but I want you to understand how they work. And again, they do work like diodes, the small gates that are used inside the board for decision making. What does that mean? If I get signal from this wire and this wire, 
What should I do? We talked before about the and and or gates. So, don't think too much about that, but if you want to make a decision, if you think of a traffic light, if you think of uh, any small circuit that can, do, that can do some kind of function, you need some kind of decision making. And that's done by transistors. For example, an AND gate. It just, you can buy it from Radio Shack, it's called an AND gate. It has two legs. Both of those legs has to be activated for the circuit to go through. If one of them is zero, the other one is not going to go through. And uh, why do we need that? To make small logic. I need the heat on and the light on, otherwise the valve will be open. So to make small decision like that, based on input. And if you open up uh, this Honeywell control, probably has few and and or gets in it. If, I, if the, how else would it know? If the FF terminal is shorted, I'm not going to turn on the ignition. There are two feedbacks in it. And if they're not both energized, it's not going to turn on the circuit for the ignition. So it's composed of little gates like that. The AND gate and OR gate, OR means either OR. Any of those, if it's on, the gate will be open and will let the current go through it. If you go walk in electronics, probably that will make a lot of sense for you. Uh, I'm just going to brush over it for now. At least you know how to use this as a black box, and you can interpret the logic in it. Uh, we did the lab yesterday, it was very, very nice. Uh, you guys liked it? Yeah. Where we wired this, uh, we wired this uh, control, and uh, it, uh, it does sense the light, it has sequence of operation, it has delays, and all that is done with the small control. This is the third generation of Honeywell. Uh, Again, the same idea goes to industrial control. They get they just get bigger and have they have more options. Uh, voltage spikes. So, voltage spikes happen. It's kind of like power surge when you have uh, when you connect equipment directly to the power line, and they happen for many reasons. Sometimes storms, sometimes interruption in the transmission, sometimes glitches in the system. And what happens is when you have a surge protector, it will regulate that voltage coming into the system. So for most electronics, you'll have some kind of surge protection or power stabilizer. Otherwise, you might burn the components. And again, we said the components work with very, very minimum voltage. And if you look at those resistors, they're very small. So any excess voltage can break those components. Uh, so that's why when we have a voltage spike, you want something to absorb that spike and normalize the voltage. Uh, this is a comparison of how things have changed from this relay, mechanical relay, and vacuum tubes to a small little transistor. So back in the days, if you ever seen the mainframe, was as big as this room, or controls were really, really huge, and to have small electronic components was very difficult. <clears throat> so imagine the size, imagine the power, imagine the cooling. It was very, very huge. However, it did function, they did do some work, but now it got smaller and smaller, and now the complete board is printed. There's not even wire welding or solder whatsoever. The whole thing is printed. The smaller we get, the more accuracy we get, the less trouble we have with the logic, and the, uh, what else? We can fit more, more logic into smaller area. I mean, uh, it was almost impossible in the 90s to have all this computing power in a small computer, and it's a small handheld device. Your phone now is probably stronger than, has better calculation power, computation power than the computer in the 90s. And all this happened because of the condensing of the semiconductors and the logic of small printed boards. Uh, so a lot of improvement from 50 years ago, and probably if you see some controls from the past, they're very, very huge and heavy. Uh, probably you won't see those anymore. When we do the controls, I'll have you wire some controls here because probably they're still working. And why is that? Because they function. 
and they function very well. And, and, less, and those plants are designed to last for 50 years. They are priced and designed to last for 50 years and they should continue. Uh, so we're not going to change everything. We're gonna keep it going. Um, but however, for new installation, probably you will not see all those big, huge controls. If you go with Thermoprise, it has a digital screen, has a controller completely uh, electronic. You will see a lot of mechanical relays. <coughs> so vacuum tubes, mechanical relays, for semiconductors and diodes. So it gets really smaller and uh, advanced. Solid state, physical description of the component. It means there is no mechanical pass going through it. Uh, it has a semiconductor. Uh, semiconductor electrical conductivity is material. So we know there are conductors and insulators, right? Mm -hmm. What are conductors? Give me an example of a conductor. Copper. Copper. Oh, rubber. Huh? Rubber. Conductor. Rubber is an insulator, right? Rubber is an insulator. Gold. Gold, platinum. Metals. Silver, iron, copper, the conductor. In the opposite, we have the insulators, which are non-conductors. Rubbers, Paper. plastics, Wood. fibers. Wood. You get the idea. In the middle, if you look at the timetable, time table, periodic table, it has on one hand the insulator, and the other side there is the conductors. In the middle, there is something called the semi semiconductors. Uh, semiconductors basically come with silicon and some other ceramics and materials. And what made those uh, materials very, very special is uh, somebody realized that they do not conduct electricity. However, if you energize them, they will conduct electricity. So that, were, that were became really great idea. So I can have them work on command. And I can have the circuit have less gates in it. So before, I'll go again with the idea of gates. <clears throat> so for me to, in the, in the past, to have this kind of gates, I'll have to have actual switches inside the gate. Switches have to be open, both or closed. This is an old gate. Uh, and I have to connect it in parallel or in series <clears throat> to start this logic. and uh, that will be completely switches. Now, with the semiconductor, if there is power coming here, this piece will be conductor, and this will be a closed gate. So the current will go through it. Once I de-energize this little piece of material, it become non-conductor and it will insulate. And again, we said before that there is no absolute insulator. So the power has to be very, very small of going through it. Otherwise, it will go through. So it's very, very calculated. That's why things do malfunction if you expose them to a lot of power and probably they lose their properties. Uh, so they play four or five semiconductor actions. Uh, good conductors are copper, silver, and aluminum. And poor conductors are plastic, glass, and mica. Silicon is a, again semiconductor, and it helps a lot for us to to do boards. Those green boards are made of semiconductors, and uh, we put a lot of controls items in them. And that was the rise, of, I guess, uh, for uh, electronics and Silicon Valley. They call it Silicon Valley because it's a lot of silicon, a lot of controls, and a lot of uh, electronics. Diodes and rectifiers. Again, if you can remember that diode is a check valve for current, I'll be happy. That's enough. At least you know it's a component that allows the current to go only in one direction and not back. Uh, these are the simplest solid state components. I am not uh, electronic major. I don't know much about electronics, but I know the major components. I know how they function. And uh, that's what you need to know. And if you happen to be in an to work in electronics, which is actually a good field now. Uh, I know that there are a few manufacturers here in Massachusetts that manufactures uh, boards. They print boards, circuit boards, in here, in-house. Uh, Mystic print their own boards. So it's a good job to get into it. Um, we also have an electronic major here. You can take a couple of courses to know how 
to fix or diagnose electronics. It's a really fun job, uh, but it depends on what field you're into. Uh, and nowadays there's a change of direction on, on just importing uh, controls. A lot of companies, small startup companies, they do their own controls. So you can do your own controls and do your own uh, building management. So diodes and rectifiers have similar components and they are rated above one ampere. So that allows the current to go only in one direction. Rectifiers, uh, again, they have more capacity than diode and they are used for power conversion. Question? Oh, what's the application of the diode? If you wanted it <coughs> no, it's a good question, but what, what I meant by one direction is uh, the conversion from AC to DC, oh, okay. one, so positive and minus, so it will only allow the positive to go in and not back. Okay. And uh, if you think of that as well, so if you put the hot in this side, it will go through. However, if you put the power line here, it's not going to go through. Okay. So it gets for surge of control and it goes through. Transistors, uh, I don't know if this is very, very important for you to learn, but uh, it's in the book, just brush over it. In case you go interview in a place where they want you to know a little bit of electronics, I'm trying to give you a variety of what's out there. Uh, so N times or P times material, they're both semiconductors and they are put in a sandwich like, I'm not gonna ask you this, so I don't worry too much about it, as long as you understand. Semiconductors, they arrange on top of each other just like a sandwich, and that will change their properties. There are materials that uh, pass currents in certain ways, and these are the, uh, the basis of making rectifiers and uh, diodes. So based on the way you put them, they will pass the current from one direction to another. Uh, I don't even think the book that goes too much into it, but uh, they are positive, negative, positive. That's what the PAP means. Positive material, negative material, then positive again. What do we mean by positive and negative? That's the charge of electrons. And if you go with AC, it goes always between positive and negative. So it has something to do with their organization and how will they pass the current. And N, P, N, again, it's a sandwich, three layers, negative, positive, and negatives. I put it on the meter. Don't remember that. Triacs are electronic controls with two diodes and a single device. So this is the diode here. And I would say the diode only has the check valve for the direction of the, of the current. So they are used as switches in the AC circuit, so all the current to pass through one direction when certain current level is reached at the gate. So if you think about it, that's pretty important because you can control the amount of current going to some component. And also, that could be helpful in uh, detecting excess current and also for safe protection. And they are used for relays in electrical circuits. And so we have diodes, rectifiers, and triacs. So in case you're into a tri triac, you want to be like shot, you, you understand it's some kind of combination of uh, diodes. And again, unless you walk into electronics or troubleshooting uh, printed board, it's not going to be a big deal. LEDs. So LEDs have been used a uh, long time. It's uh, it got to become has more brightness. It used to be less bright than it is now. It was uh, a flow through a diode, but they realized that the material that they use in the diode that are glowing, so they used that in the circuit. They used it in the circuit because it does not consume a lot of power, only a tiny amount of amperage is enough to light it up. And somebody figured out a way to make it very, very bright so they can use it for lighting a house or a flashlight. Uh, but again, the purpose of a diode is, uh, again, to pass current through in one direction 
and uh, LED is a small light. The indicator that circuit inside the board is being activated. So you'll see those in some, actually in uh, Teco, zone valves, in, uh, in most controls for Honeywell's Aquastats, and even this uh, control has a light, has a LED in it to tell you what is the resistance, uh, what is the, if, the, if there is fire inside the chamber or not. We talked a little bit about thermistors two minutes ago. So Austin, what's a thermistor? Thermistor is a device Okay. Thank you. It's a device that detects uh, temperature using by changing the, the resistance. What are thermocouples? Thermocouples. Somebody. No. What are thermocouples? Yeah. Isn't yeah. it like some sort of that where it senses heat? Yeah. The power or tells like the gas power or whatever that flames or whatever? Yeah. Basically, it's, uh, it's a probe that senses temperature, but the thermocouples is two similar metals connected together. So you can take two wires and join them at the tip. And that, when this uh, tip heats up, it will generate small amount of voltage, very, very small amount of voltage. And uh, you calibrate that, so you know at zero degree, this is the amount of voltage will be generated, and 100 degree, this is what uh, the amount of voltage that will be generated, and you graphic. Isn't it kind of like um, switching a thermostat? Yeah. Definitely. When it gets too hot, um, the piece of metal uh, closes the circuit? No, that's bimetal. Oh, okay. So bimetal is mechanical. It expands. Right. This thing is just a small tip, and you can actually, when you buy uh, a multimeter, it comes with a thermocouple. It's already calibrated. So you put the uh, multimeter on temperature, and it will measure. It is calibrated for the amount of voltage it will make. So thermocouples measure temperature by producing voltage. Thermistor measure temperature by uh, changing resistance. What else we have for temperature? Bimetals, they change size based on uh, temperature. And we make them very sensitive by having very, very thin to dissimilar mineral against stuck to each other. So they'll expand with different rate, which makes them twist and elongate quickly. So when we do the stack control relay, you can see actually the, the, the helical shaped strip expand and retract with only hot air. So we want to be more sensitive. If you open up the all thermostats, it has a spiral that will expand uh, fast with temperature. So when we do a lot of uh, temperature controls, there are some things that we want to consider. What are our limits? What is the temperature limit? Think about that uh, when we get any kind of uh, thermometer. Let's go with the weather thermometer, like put it in the fridge. Does it, it has limits, right? What happens if you exceed that limit? Breaks. It will explode. The, the red liquid inside will come out of the, of the, of the vessel. I, I, I once he overheated the mercury thermostat, I mean thermometer, to see what happens. So I put the lighter there and pff, the whole thing up, spilled out. So I was only six years old, so don't do that. <laughs> so what's gonna happen if I, if I keep eating it? <laughs> Maybe seven, I don't know. But uh, I want to see what happens if, if I keep eating it. So eventually it got so hot and it, it exploded. And uh, if you work with uh, the Aquastat now with the liquid probe, don't overheat it, it will explode. I don't have a lot of experience. So there's a big bulb full of liquid and a cap there too. I'll show you. So what happened yesterday? We blew we blew this in the in the lab. So this is full of uh, liquid. The liquid will expand mechanically and push it to this diaphragm over here. Do you purposely made it explode the lab? Not purposely, it's experimentation. 
for the sake of science, to see what happened. So we overheated it, not purposefully. We thought it like it stuck or malfunctioned, and it exploded, and it was kind of violent. So don't do that. Look, and it, this is actually thick copper, so it takes a lot of pressure to burst this. So always know what is the limits for those probes. Whenever you have any uh, temperature controls, temperature sensors, check the limits and make sure you are within the limits. Otherwise, you might uh, break it or you might miss the calibration. You went off the calibration, you changed the properties of that sensor, it's not going to function correctly anymore once you exceed it. Uh, those, even, even thermostat, every once in a while they have to be calibrated. And another question we need to know, what is the accuracy that we need from that sensor? Some of them have to be very, very accurate within half a degree, 0.1 of a degree. It's not going to be that, uh, this accurate in our field. But we, you do want something that's within five degrees accuracy, at least even an inch back. That's a little bit too sketchy, too much. Five degrees is a little bit too much. So you want something within like one degree, half a degree. Uh, so this is a positive temperature coefficient, coefficient, resistance increases as the temperature increases, and some of the negative temperature coefficient, which resistance increase, uh, increase as the temperature decreases. Uh, there are many applications, you can find them in fridges, you can find them in ACs. Uh, if you have a window AC, probably you have a thermistor stuck to the, your evaporator that will measure the temperature, and once we reach the uh, freezing temperature, it will shut off the compressor, otherwise you'll build some frost in your evaporator, and that will, uh, of course, limit the function of your AC. <laughs> so, uh, with the, why are we talking about all those controls? Because this course is about uh, combustor controls, and how do we control our inputs? Again, our goal is to have the most automation possible. You don't want somebody standing by the boiler all the time and doing all the functions, right? which at some point used to be somebody's job. Yeah, it used to be somebody you have to go shove a coal inside the chamber all the time. Oh, it's too hot. They open the hole. The <laughs> it's, it's too cold and somebody will go on with, the, with, the, with their hand, shove things in. And, uh, or somebody will call and they will turn it on and off. So the more control you have, the less human involvement there is. And uh, who wants to do this kind of uh, dumb repetitive jobs? Seriously, it's like, uh, leave that to the machines. Human beings should do more creative things. Mm -hmm. By law, however, for safety, somebody has to be in a power plant 24 seven. That's for safety, because again, just in case you cannot trust the machine, or if they turn against you or something, you want somebody there. <laughs> it's hot, I actually looked up that thing we were talking about yesterday, and they said you need 138 uh, of those pots. Yeah, I told you, I mean, come on, it's simple math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different, uh, I'll tell you about in the other class. So somebody had a YouTube about uh, heating a plant flower pot, the clay one, with the tea can, and it's supposed to heat the house. Like, okay, just input and output. The tea can was like 10 calories. I mean, 10 BTUs an hour. <laughs> you are emitting more than that. I told you, so either if you just have to jump in jacks or like a young probe in the, in the house, you'll heat the house faster. So, uh, accuracy and uh, applications, and again, more controls. So for us, we'll have uh, high pressure controls, low pressure controls, and again, you want the least, you don't want any, any accidents. And whenever you have combustion in the house, there's always going to be some accidents, so you have to prevent against that. I mean, even if you have uh, no combustion in your house, you have a heat pump, if you uh, have a malfunction, you can have an accident, you can have the refrigerant explode. But, and isn't the refrigerant uh, flammable? Mm -hmm. It is flammable, so you should be careful with whatever equipment you run around your house. And again, uh, these uh, sensors will give you input so you can make decisions, and you can make uh, uh, better controls for those uh, uh, components. Electronics and components. Uh, so usually our equipment are powered by 110 to 220. In uh, heating, I haven't seen anything more than 220. 220 up to 480 is for industrial commercial applications. For our applications, it's mostly 110. Uh, controls usually are less for 
residential is 24 volts. I've seen 12 volts, and a lot of them are DC, so they require DC control. And why would you think DC is uh, the norm or the common thing for controls? For these things, you want control <coughs> source. You want constant, uh, constant uh, voltage. Okay. The alternation can is will confuse the system depending on what you want to control. So DC is uh, very common for control. So you always you will see always a rectifier to take the AC and put it into DC. And back in the days when you have to power your boombox or small appliance, you have this big chunky uh, transformer, right? And uh, now you don't have to. Small USB rectifier will do the job. So that's an investment. That uh, saves a lot of money and effort. One board. One board rules them all. So one board. You can have a board with all those little components in it. Uh, this is your interaction. This is your inputs. We are not going to need to sell with any of these. However, if you, just for troubleshooting purposes, you open the board. You look at it, and you can trace some lines, and if you see anything burnt, discolored, that's an indication that something went bad with that board. Uh, you will check the, the power supply, you will check the pins, uh, you can check the, the, the board visually. I will say this is a relay. Those little things are capacitors. Capacitors are used very frequently to hold the charge and also to make decisions and to alternate the, uh, the voltage. Uh, what else? bunch of diodes, resistances, and what we are concerned with is our connections here. Uh, when we saw the yesterday, the schematic for this, for wiring schematic, you saw the box, it had a lot of uh, lines inside. Did we care about those lines? No. We don't care what's inside, we just care about our connections. And we make sure that we do this connection correctly. We do not open these things and fix it, you can send it out to be fixed. Uh, and it's not sometimes it's not a big deal. You can they can change the transformer, it goes bad, and the reliability of those little components become very very high. So they hardly ever go bad. Did you ever notice that when you buy a TV, what is the warranty on it? All electronics now. One year. One year. Why? They go bad quick. No. Because they go bad after one year. No, because if so they, they can you make your money back. No. No. So it's it does go bad within a year. Huh? Yeah, the thing is, like they made the, the study that okay, if it make it two years, it's gonna make it ten years. If it, if there's any manufacturing error in it, those components will not last a year. Anything beyond one year, the components are sound. It's on you. That's why it's only one year. So if anything, any of those little components, the transformers, the trans resistors, whatsoever, went bad within a year, it's our fault. It's the manufacturing fault. And they do a lot of testing on those components. And they became very, they've been doing it for like 40 years now. So they now do them very, very correctly. Sometimes the connection goes bad, there's a probability. Because those, uh, you think somebody's welding those things? No, there are machines. Spot weld them, do it very quickly. There are those machines sometimes do some anomaly, they go bad. So they take the responsibility. However, if it goes for one entire year without any issues, it's gonna go for 10 years. It's not going to break at all. And uh, I found this to be very, very true. So do not buy the extended warranty. That's a scam. <laughs> and actually, I read uh, in Business Magazine that uh, this is why Circus City went out of business. They were not making money out of selling the, the, the product. They were making money of the warranties. <laughs> so anyways, so the warranty you do not need. And for electronics, if it runs, the first time it's gonna run, for a long, long time. And uh, the average for those uh, components is 10 years. They should be running for 10 years. Electronics do not go bad. And probably if you have uh, a stereo system from the 80s, most likely it's working. What, what did these to go bad? The transformer, a fuse, hard labor, hard labor like a capacitor. Maybe capacitors will go bad <laughs> for a long time. But usually it's, it stays a long time. Uh, the VCR has a lot of uh, mechanical components, so it goes bad. Faster, but uh, electronics they nothing breaks them. Okay, so we have uh, we have temperature readers that can go into liquid, and we have temperature readers that can go into air, and you should be careful in how they are placed, 
and how we, they're supposed to read the temperature. Um, we talk about thermistors, same thing. Oh, some, this is really interesting. For some thermistors and some thermocouples, whatever it is, is very, very sensitive, uh, so it has to be connected to uh, a device that will read the interpretation of that uh, change. The change of ther uh, in uh, resistance for a thermistor is very, very small. So probably even if you go with a multimeter, probably you're not going to be able to measure it as much. So to correspond that to a temperature, you need a sensitive ear or an amplifier. And you'll see that also with the rectifying flame rod, uh, it goes through an amplifier that will change, amplify the signal so it can correspond to the temperature and flame inside the chamber. And again, with the thermocouple, when you heat the thermocouple, it's really amazing. If you measure that with uh, uh, an ohmmeter, it's very, very small. Like the, the, the voltage is like 0 0.00 millivolt. Very, very small. So from 0 0.004 to 0 0.006, that's two degrees. So you need something as sensitive as that uh, thermocouple to measure the, the temperature. And again, thermocouples uh, change sensitivity based on, if you think of the device, what do you think will change the sensitivity and reaction time for those? The size of the wire, for example. How long is it exposed to the liquid? Is it submerging water or is it just exposing air? How fast is the air or fluid going through it? That will change its, uh, its uh, reaction time. So let's take it again. So for electronics, Again, uh, I can talk about these things a lot, but it's good to see them face to face in the lab. And uh, again, from the first lab, what did this thing do? It provided you with time, it provided you with the uh, delay, it provided you with sequence of operation, which means I want you first to check for me if there is fire in the chamber. How did it do that? The cat cell control. It's a very simple operation, dark or light, different resistance, uh, that's an input. And do I need heat? The thermostat it has a connection here. You connect the thermostat. So the thermostat says we need heat. The FF terminals connected to the CAD control will tell you it's dark, so we need some fire. We turn on the fire. How do we turn on the fire? First of all, I will turn on the ignition and the motor together. So those are connected in parallel. At this point, they turn on. There's 15 second delay before the oil valve comes up. So we want to make sure there is the motor is running, there is air, and there's also something called pre-purging. I want to get rid of all the air inside the chamber, whatever it is, it's moisture, residual smokes, and get fresh air. I think 15 seconds is enough. When we go to industrial, it's going to be more involved for these little small processes. We turn on the ignition and motor, give them for 10 seconds, then the oil valve will open up. What's going to come into the chamber? Uh, the vapor, I mean the atomized uh, oil. And we wait for the fire. So the whole thing from start till the fire is 30 seconds. From the motor and the ignition to come up and the valve is 15 seconds. So 30 seconds now is the law. Within 30 seconds, there is no fire. I expect fire to come in 15 seconds. As soon as the oil comes up, there should be fire. No fire, 15 seconds, we shut off the whole thing. Abort the whole mission. Otherwise, you're going to keep pumping oil inside the chamber, and you don't want that. So it has also small options here where you can reprogram. And you see this port here? That also does, uh, you can have a diagnosis machine. You put it in and see if the control is okay or not. Uh, no, Sorry about yeah. the interruption, but on the digital readout ones, it does that all, all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's, that's the fourth Really, I, I love it. It's awesome. It's like only, I think one forty dollars for that, but it, it tells you everything. And what I like about it, it said, okay, it's in standby now. Trying for ignition. Flame proven. And it gives you the strength of the flame. It's in the ohms. So it reads the ohms. The stronger the flame, the less the ohms. Because the cat cell just in the dark is very high, right? You agree with that? That's one of the questions actually they put in the oil burn technician license. The, oil, uh, the cat cell resistance in the dark is above 10,000. Up to 16,000, it's supposed to be above 10,000. In the light, less than 1,000. 100,000? No, no, no. 
And uh, uh, also think of the, your car computer. Your car computer, probably as big as this, right? And it's like $3,000 or so. Uh, what it does, it has diagnostic machines, it has errors, it has goes in safety, it has check engines, and it does a lot of functions, and it's just plug and play, huh? Yeah, it does a lot of things, and uh, they're kind of universal for the manufacturer. Uh, and it's, uh, I can compare, the, compare that to the commercial uh, controllers. More functions, more delays, and you can also reprogram it. In some cars, actually, you can take the computers and put a sport module. They all change the oxidation, they do that. Or some people actually, they take it out and they re reprogram it, which is not really that uh, difficult. I had somebody fix my own computer for like $300, which saved me a lot of money. It's sort of like $3,000 for my new computer. So something went bad in it, and you went there and you just like fixed it. Of course, the car was like 20 years old, so. They don't make it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Timers, uh, timers are always small. IC, what's an IC? Integrated circuit component. So when you go to Regishock, they say IC for everything. Uh, it could be a resistor, it could be a capacitor, just an IC. Yeah, that's when you go and fix your, your VCR somewhere. What's, what's wrong with it? And I see, okay. <laughs> Integrated circuit component. Uh, so the timers are very small components you buy from Radio Shack. They can give you a 10 seconds IC, 40 seconds IC, which basically it, the time for it to let the circuit go through it. it Take some time to have the circuit go through it. Those are electronic timers. There are also mechanical timers. For the electronics, this is how it functions, and you just change it. Uh, some of them actually you can change by just uh, uh, look. For here, if you look, there's like two small buttons on the side, which will change the recycling time. So it actually it says that here the delay for the for the oil valve can be 30 seconds, and it could be eight minutes. So valve on delay time, 15 seconds, that's fixed. Then burn a motor off delay time. You can change that as much as you want. I'm going to pass this to you guys. Look at the little fonts and the little buttons in it. Um, this is one of the most common controllers. You'll see that probably in every house. Or you'll see the old generation, which you should change by the law now. The old first generation Honeywell control, because they did change the time, the delay time. I mean, the safety lockout time from uh, 45 seconds into 30 seconds. That, that, that's last year. So it's 30 seconds now. So you, you probably last year, if you walked around, you'll see a lot of the old controls being thrown away. It's not no longer the code. And uh, the new ones are not that expensive, so I, I advise, if you go on your service call, just upgrade to the new ones. Not this one, the, the new model. Uh, well, so they can operate uh, with a delay in closing and opening devices, and some of them you can change, which is very convenient. Uh, compact and easy to install, and these actually can be installed on top of the junction and the junction box. And uh, let me see a little bit. So, also, if you if you notice uh, in the bottom here, they're trying to make you have very concise uh, wiring, meaning for all components like ignition, motor, or valve, there's a, a neutral line here. So you don't have to run all neutral together in a bundle. You can go back to the control. So there's a, a, these four neutral lines are connected together. They're all connected together. So one of them will go to the neutral from the uh, power line, and the other subcomponents will go into the control, which is very convenient. Before that, you have to bundle everything in one big wire nut and put them in the bridge. So this is uh, very convenient. So, delay and make or break timers. So, delay or make times. So, it's delay closing of the device for a predetermined time uh, period, which means uh, similar to here is the oil valve. So, the oil valve is energized, but there's a delay component in there, which is fixed 15 seconds. And that's probably one of the ICs with 15 seconds. 
if you want to change that, probably you have to go and change that IC. Uh, delay on break timers. So timers will circle, and here comes the idea or the benefit of uh, a capacitor. So a capacitor holds a charge, right? So you charge and discharge a capacitor to use it as a timer in one of those circuits. Uh, for these ones, you can recycle for three times. So you, you recycle them three times, uh, which means first time it tried for ignition, nothing happened, it will go on safety, you can hit the button and it will try again. And sometimes it will try by itself in 30 seconds. It will tell you there's delay of 30 seconds, or 45 seconds, or two minutes. So that's what you're changing over here. So you change it, then it will recycle, and uh, after three times it will go on something called a safety lockout, which also known as the hard lockout. Let me write this down. So there's a lot of terminology you have to remember, and uh, again, if you're going to be in the business, you will it will be easier to remember those, but for now, uh, there's something called a safety lockout. Or hard. Yeah. Which means what? The equipment, the control, not recycle. What is recycling? So we tried, it will try uh, three times for residential to recycle. For industrial, there is no recycling. You get one time, and what is the delay time? What is the requirement time to, to proof uh, flame? 30 seconds. No, for the, for 30 seconds for residential. For commercial, mm -hmm. zero to three seconds. Three seconds is the maximum. So we want proven flame right away. We're not going to wait. And the reason for that, I'll keep repeating that, is uh, because we are putting a lot of fuel inside the chamber. Question? When you, when you say commercial, you're talking buildings, uh, yeah. air, you know, places like that, like, how about a larger home heating system? That's not commercial. It, it depends on the can size. Can you put a commercial? Yeah, you can, but it depends on the BTUs. Commercials, they don't, they go with, they don't go with 60 or 70 or 100 or 200 uh, BTUs, no. That's a half a million BTUs. So that's commercial. Half a million BTUs, that's commercial. I think anything above 250,000 BTUs is commercial. Commercial size. Yeah. Real talk, um, residential is like homes, not the schools and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, based on the size. So, timers. For uh, residentials, we cannot change them unless if you look at the side. Those, uh, if you look here, this you can change. You can change the timer. And if you read, it tell you what the settings and how much time you get out of it.
anti short cycling devices prevent the optical loads from stopping and starting in rapid succession. That's really, that saved a lot of uh, equipment from breaking. So remember, again, back in the 80s, when do ACs? Uh, there's a big sign on the board that says, do not restart, wait three minutes before restarting. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, the new ones, you can, you can restart them, it doesn't matter. It's kind of a foolproof mechanism. So even if you restart it, if you turn it off and you change your mind, I'll turn it on, you turn it on, there's an anti-short device that will provide a delay. Once you turn it off, it gets activated, capacitor have to be charged, it takes three minutes or discharge, and that will be your timer. So it's for safety, so you do not have to surge the system or shock the motor by turning on and off, especially for compressors and ACs, they require some anti-short systems. So it will provide some delay, sometimes between 30 seconds till uh, uh, three minutes, five minutes actually, for cycling. Uh, again, we need cycling for ACs, again, because you do want to shock the system in case there's a surge. Also, if there's a power outage. Let's say the system was running, you have fire, everything is great, suddenly there's a power outage, and it came back. So, it will provide a delay to pretend that the system went out, or there was no heat, then it will start again. That it will do the pre-purging and restart the fire. So that will give you some kind of uh, delay. <coughs> Troubleshooting. I think I'll, I'll stop here and we'll finish the rest of this, of this on Wednesday. Uh, you can get a copy of my Wikipedia copies of the oil burgers. That shit is really expensive. It's like $100. Hold on. Okay.